hello everybody. Like Daria was kind enough to say, uh, my name is Maji <clears throat> and I am a software writer, which means I write software. If you didn't get that, I just write software. I'm not a coder, I'm not a developer, and I just write software. And the difference is, if you don't know, software written is written so that people can read it, hence the quality and all that stuff. Okay, uh, having that aside, uh, let's see if we can share some screen here. Uh, in the chat, can you quickly say, can you see the screen? Thank you. So, Vue.js base, uh, basics and best practices. Uh, please be noted, I am a little bit nervous. This is my first webinar on that scale. So <clears throat> if I say something wrong or just stupid, please tell me in the chat so that I know I did it. <clears throat> Moving on, a brief disclaimer before we begin, and I'm going to have to read at least part of it. Sometimes I get carried away. If you disagree with me, just stand up and say so in the chat um, or in any other means. If you have me on Skype, you can Skype me as well. I have the Skype running. Um, keeping the presentation interactive will probably be more interesting for everybody. Having the disclaimer out of the way, the question is, what is Vue.js? Some of you might know, some of you may heard of it, but Vue.js is essentially a progressive framework. That's like a bunch of stuff that's on the, uh, on the page, on the Vue.js uh, page. But for me, Vue.js is comparable to React and Angular. It's more powerful than React. It's um, less bloated than Angular, but really it's like the best uh, middle ground before having everything delivered to you like Angular does and delivered nothing like React does. Okay, so we need to make a quick detour before we get started with Vue.js uh, as, uh, as a thing. And that's uh, generally something that I uh, like to have uh, straightened out before we go anywhere is the difference between a framework and a library. So essentially a framework is something that takes control over your code and um, only calls you sort of the um, uh, Hollywood principle, we will call you, don't call us. Uh, whereas the library is something that has utility methods essentially uh, that allow you to do stuff. So a library uh, might also contain a little bit of framework. So if you call a method from a library that takes over control, then the framework is inside of the library. Vue.js is both a library as well as a framework. Having that out of the way, um, oh, one more thing. If you have any questions during the presentation, which might come, might not come, please shoot them out in the uh, section with the Q&A section. Um, uh, beer, what kind of beer I, um, I uh, recommend? Uh, well, currently, Kastellan. But if you find that's too, uh, that's, uh, too common, then uh, any craft beer uh, will do. Uh, having, having that uh, answered, uh, let's um, maybe jump into some code because talking is cheap, show me the code. There we have some Visual Studio code. And first thing that I would like to show you is that Vue.js is completely unlike any of the other libraries that you will find. It does not require, it can use, but does not require any compilation steps or pre-compilation step or however you want to call it. No pre-processing whatsoever. And I'm going to demonstrate to you that by using Vue.js like I would use normally uh, the good old, um, the good old jQuery. So let me just create an index.html page. I'm going to open it up here. And by virtue of uh, a good old friend Emmett. I just created a page. Let's put that down. And let's call it hello view. Um, we're going to create first um, a web page that contains of just a single div ID app. Go figure. Uh, it's not going to do anything. Uh, or let's maybe 
force it to do uh, to show a message so that it knows something is working or something tends to be different. Um, to ease up on the pain of refreshing um, a page, I'm going to start <clears throat> a live server. Uh, if you don't know how to start that one or how to how to deal with that guy, uh, it's quite simple. You just uh, globally install the live server, live dash server um, npm package, and you're good to go. Okay, so we've got our message. Let's make it maybe a little bit bigger, like an h1. Why not? Uh, but that's really not not really interesting. So we're gonna have to import Vue.js like you would normally do. And I think I have that in here. Yeah. I have some snippets, so I will be cheating with copy pasting. Sorry. And we also need to instantiate our application. So we're gonna do that in a separate script block. And there you go. So what happened here, man, what happened? First, we have instantiated a new Vue.js instance that's called the, by, by calling the Vue constructor. We told it that everything it needs to display is contained within a, um, an element that has an ID app, which is pretty much the div we've got here. Then uh, we said, okay, whenever the template would like to render something, it's gonna take it from the data section and the data section contains just one element. It's like a dictionary of, um, of elements that you can display. And Vue.js is obviously using the mustache um, syntax, so double curly braces. And that's what we've got here. If we change it to, let's say, adding a few more uh, exclamation marks because Vue is so cool, <clears throat> the live server rebuilt it or reserved it. Uh, the browser knows there's a new version. And so hence we see a new uh, thing. I would like to show you something a little bit more interesting. Uh, if we um, assign it to a um, value called, <clears throat> called app, we should have that app available to us um, <clears throat> as, uh, as an instance here in the browser. So what we can do now is uh, do something like this, app.message equals uh, soft serve is doing great. Or maybe uh, here's the best webinar you ever experience. See, <clears throat> that says that the message property has emerged out of the data section here and it is reactive. What it means reactive is that the message is actually a getter and a setter. And Vue tracks all the getters that have been used within the uh, template section. And so if you set it using the provided setter, uh, you will influence immediately the rendering of, um, of that application the entire block that actually contains the, um, the data that's been uh, used for rendering. So that means that the Vue.js library or framework is reactive, if you would ever be uh, asked about that. Uh, now Vue.js allows you also to uh, do two-way bindings and to demonstrate that, uh, it's extremely simple. We're just gonna put in a, uh, an input field here and we're going to use something that called the V model. Now, <clears throat> pay attention here. Uh, v model is a directive. A directive is something that you provides, um, some, some of the directives are provided out of the box, like the V model, but you can also create um, your custom ones. You will see that in a second, uh, that this is um, how this is done and how, it's, uh, how it can be used. Um, for now, let's, um, let's just say that V model means that we want to both um, sort of uh, display the value as well as if the input is changing the value, we would like to propagate that information into the, um, into the model, so to speak. So we're gonna save that. We are back to Vue.js is cool. But you notice that if I change it, Uh, 
it changes the header as well. So the data in the application automatically uh, depicts, maybe I can make that a little bit bigger. Um, the data uh, depicts exactly that um, the change has happened also to the data and the data is displayed in the header. Okay. Um, Vue.js is also a component-based uh, framework. What it means that is that we can create components, much like in Angular or React, and those components can be then part of uh, the application. So here I have a simple component that has a template. Please note the template has also an ID field, and that ID field is how we're going to reference the template in the view components uh, definition. The second thing that is interesting for uh, defining a component is how it inputs some data or how it receives some data <clears throat> and how later on that data could be propagated upwards. Um, in React, for example, you have the concept of passing, uh, passing in functions that will be called. In React, uh, there is a concept called events, but we'll get to that in a, um, in a later section when we're gonna talk about how to implement a um, component that also propagates uh, events. So for now, uh, let's just switch our H1 into a message. And that message has one property called text. So we're gonna do uh, vbind uh, equals message. <clears throat> and when we save that, oh, we have a problem. Vbind obviously uh, text. And you will see that hello Vue.js, there's a uh, <clears throat> there's a message being displayed. Uh, Vue also provides something called uh, the Vue.js tools. I'm going to have to make that uh, bigger in order to show you what I what it uh, actually does, uh, like so. And you will see there is a component message. That component has one property called text. It has no data in it. However, the root, the main application, has some data that we've got here. And quite frankly, I have no idea why the hell the input is not rendering. Well, let's skip that quietly. Actually, we can't skip that. We have to have the property displayed. Maybe like this. No? Why don't you wanna render? Piece of crap. Uh, we have the template here. Mamma mia, what if I change this? Okay, it works. Maybe if I do this, it will also work. No. Okay, so for now, let's uh, get back. Sorry, I'm not going to waste much time. I'm just going to go back to uh, the place where that I know it works. And we have an input. We also need some h tag. So let's do it with h3 this time. And now, <clears throat> if you notice, this um, input field uh, upon entering the page is not active. Uh, it would be awesome if we could just by entering the page making make this input um, automatically focused or so active. For that, we, for that purpose, we have things like, oh, I know why it didn't work. I am so happy. There we go. Yes. Woohoo. Um, there's a question from Miho. Isn't that a message with capital letter and you called component with small letter? Just a thought. No, it was. Um, it's actually case insensitive, but good catch. Thank you. Um, the reason why it didn't render is because all the custom tags in HTML need to have a closing tag. Remember that, yes, remember. Okay, uh, moving on, we're gonna implement something that is called vFocus. Whenever you have <clears throat> a uh, whenever you have a directive that is not uh, like used or defined, you will not see it in here. It's just not there. 
whenever it, uh, obviously whenever it starts with a uh, with a v because those are specific uh, when it doesn't it will be passed on okay so if you uh, sort of defines the way a custom directive is defined by is by pre uh, fixing it with v dash similar by the way to how angular does it but angular does it with ng Okay, so we've got the defocus. It's not doing anything. If I um, activate the web page, we see that border here around it is sort of grayish. So how about we define the, uh, the thing here? And here's how a directive view is defined. So we call the view.directive, similarly to how we done, we've done it with the component. It needs a name, uh, but please be aware that it does not need to have the v dash prefix. It's just the name of it. And v dash is sort of a technicality uh, that distinguishes directives, the built in ones into HTML versus the ones that are provided by Vue.js. And then we implement a method called um, inserted. That means it's a callback. Uh, that will fire whenever the element is inserted into the DOM. So if I save this now, you will notice, hopefully, <clears throat> up upon refreshing, that the uh, input is active. So let's uh, change that text into something shorter. I'm refreshing the page and immediately the uh, input is active. So that's how you define um, and directives in view. Any questions so far? Because we're at the end of chapter one, and I think I'm ready to pick up some questions. <clears throat> okay. Uh, for what reason do you have a, mm, separate blocks of script, uh, and if that makes a difference? Um, I don't have them anymore, Camille. Does that answer your question? I hope so. Okay, will the code sample be available after webinar? That's a very good question, and thank you for asking. I'm going to show you something that uh, you probably didn't expect. I didn't expect it till yesterday. Uh, this is an application that you can download from my GitHub account, github.com slash teleprompter, I guess it is, teleprompter. You can clone it. It's uh, going to contain both the presentation as well as um, the application itself, as well as all the code in a ready to use fashion. So we have three sections here. We just went through the public uh, pure HTML section and you have all the hints that I've got on my teleprompter in here uh, for, for use. So I hope that will help you uh, like be with me next time. Any more questions? Come on people, keep them coming. Okay, uh, no questions. Okay, yeah, I get it. You guys are also <clears throat> stressed a little bit like I am. I hope so, because that's that would be at least fair. Uh, <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, let's just make some room for the question and answers. Uh, okay, uh, Tomasz Kwiatkowski mentioned that uh, it would be worth um, telling the difference between directive and a component. Okay. Um, a component is something that resembles a tag in HTML. It's something that can have a body um, and essentially is a building block for uh, the application itself. Okay? It's like extension of the DOM. However, a directive is something that you put on a declaration of a, uh, of a tag, similarly to on click on uh, mouse move or maybe input type those are the, those are the like direct uh, compar comparable elements to uh, directives and the directives can be placed on multiple or, or on different elements but they change the behavior a directive a, a component is um, either rendered or behaves like in this case we change the behavior of an input that whenever the page is loaded or is exact, to be exact, whenever the element is inserted into the page, 
then um, you will is essentially see the element uh, as uh, focused. Thomas, does that satisfy your need for knowledge regarding difference between component and um, and a um, directive? Thank you. Okay, we have some questions from the chat. Um, why don't you use message slash message? I think uh, I already uh, did. Thank you. Um, and uh, what happens when there are multiple elements with the focus directive attached? That's a good question. Thank you, Marcin. I knew someone will ask that. Uh, the last one inserted will obviously get the focus because they are inserted in <clears throat> in um, in a row, and the last one inserted, the last callback will decide which uh, which element to focus. Thank you. Um, can something be put between message and slash message? Very good question. Very good question. <clears throat> okay. So what if we wanted to, instead of putting the message inside of the vbind uh, directive, we would like to do something like this. And for those of you who know already a little bit about um, web components, you will find it quite obvious that there is a slot that you can slot in and you will be able to have the exact same appearance, meaning you can enter stuff in. You could even do stuff like that. I sure hope this will not blow in my face. It didn't, thank God. Uh, but we can maybe do it uh, italics so that it shows. Yeah, we can embed stuff inside. Uh, does that answer your question? The, uh, uh, the one where that was, uh, who was that? Uh, Karolina Dudzinska, I guess that is. Uh, if there can be something rendered inside the diff. Severin said, we can say the directive are some kind of arguments in the HTML uh, tab. Uh, yes, exactly. Those are <clears throat> attributes to be exact. The name, the, the, the right name is, uh, is arguments. Okay. Um, if you've got more questions, type them in. I will try to, um, I will try to answer them uh, later on. <clears throat> for now, let's move on to a more serious uh, thing because that is good for the same thing as jQuery is, meaning, oh, that's the uh, Omular, um, Guinness in progress. Good job. Um, now we're going to move on to a more uh, proper, as you will say, uh, Vue.js development environment. So um, I hope you can see that one. Uh, if you can't, uh, you need to move your screen a little bit to see the bottom of it. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to install Vue.js uh, command line tools or the interface for Vue.js. npm install dash g because we want this one to be public to be generally available in the command line. V at view slash CLI. Obviously, I did that before, so it won't do anything, but it will do this. I have a view command. That view command uh, takes an app name and a command. In this case, it's create. It also takes some more, but we are not concerned with that at the moment. So view create, let's do hello world the um, mandatory. It allows you to select a lot of things for the purposes of uh, speeding things a little bit up. I am going, because we've got lots of ground to cover. I am going to select the defaults, which is use Babel for a transpilation and use ESLint for, for error prevention. And just like that, in just a few moments, which is a good time to take a sip. Mm, water. Why am I not taking the beer? I don't know. There's another question. Is focus a custom directive you made or is it out of the box uh, a view directive? It's a custom directive declared in here. Dusan. 
Does that answer your question? Do some resin. Thank you. Um, Alessa also, uh, Alessia, I'm sorry. Uh, if I mispronounce your name, uh, please don't hurt me. Don't strike me with any calls. I might not know the pronunciation of your name. Uh, do I use VBind or column text uh, or VBind column text or just column text in real projects? We'll get to that in a second. I promise uh, the short answer is I would never write VBind or VON, not in a million years. It's just too, uh, just too much. Okay, um, the view CLI is uh, ready. Uh, and if we do CD hello world and then npm run serve as depicted here in the console, we should have an application running. So CD hello npm run serve. And a, with that in just a second, we should have something running on port 8080, which is the same port here. And there we go, we have a simple application running. Uh, that simple application has a structure, which I think is very well worth talking about. So we have the assets folder where all your static assets will go. We have a, an example component in a single file component, which I'm going to talk to, uh, to you about in just a second. And we have the main application component and the main application file. The main application file is not so much interesting. It just imports view and the main application component and it just instantiates it. The main application file, however, is something very, very interesting. So it shows that um, it has a three sections, the style, the script, and the template on the top. Um, obviously, in the, temp the template section is uh, bears a resemblance, a resemblance to uh, this section here, where we have defined the template for our component. This is exactly the same thing. Um, the script section is exactly the same thing as we had this component definition here. So those two sections, so this one, and the whole section here is exactly the same. Okay, it just exports the definition. There are a few other options which I'm not going to cover today. We can make class-based components. We can just extend view uh, with the component definition. But for now, just keep in mind that this is the bare bone basic definition and it is being used through in other, uh, in other components as well or in, in real life projects. That's how you use it as well. Now here we've got something very interesting. We have the name, which we can delete, it's not necessary. But then we have a, a section called components. And please notice it's an object definition, which uses the uh, shorthand version. Uh, hello world. Uh, the shorthand definition of objects in uh, ES6. The reason is that on the right hand side, so the value of it, is the actual component definition, which we're going to see in just a moment. And the left-hand side is how you would like to call this particular component inside the template. So if we do this, hello world one one, and so, then the template still renders properly, okay? If I remove this, you will see that view just freaked out about a missing component, hello, component hello world one. So the usual thing is to just uh, use the shorthand version of uh, field definition for components and just type in the uh, component name. Since those are more or less constructors, constructors, not exactly, those are still object definitions, but they're being treated like constructors because we instantiate them in the template, it is customary to um, name the components with an uppercase and then follow the generally the Pascal case convention. So uppercase for every single word, including the first one. Um, it's also customary to name the file name exactly the same as the component, just so that it, they are easier to find. Uh, and the style section. The style section is uh, really interesting because it can have a, um, maybe we've got that in the um, 
in this example component being provided, we've got something scoped. Yeah, the scoped attribute. The scoped attribute is um, it's Vue's way of making sure that you don't have clashes in um, in styles. So as you can see, we're styling here an H3, a UL, an LI, and an anchor, but those are not propagating directly to um, to the application itself. So if I do a an H1, hello world, you will see that this H1, uh, you should see that this H1 and that H1 should show differently. If we do H1 um, font, family for let's say font size uh, 10. This will influence both, but if I do scoped, you will see that only this H1 inside this component here is um, created using different styles. How Vue does it is also <laughs> quite interesting, very simplistic uh, approach here. Vue adds a v, uh, data dash v uh, dash um, some random number uh, and appends that to uh, all the styles in here. So kind of simple, but uh, but works. So that's uh, styled scopes for you. Any questions about the nature of the view single file components? So the files with dot view extension. Okay. Uh, if there will be any questions, please type them in. I will answer them uh, soon. Now, from this moment on, we're going to go really fast because we've got very little time. Uh, and I have a ton of stuff to show you, which I would like to make sure that you get it all. I'm going to delete the uh, example component, delete. And I'm going to paste in my simplistic uh, Vue.js application, which again shows just the hello world. Now, next thing we're going to do is we're going to show a dialog. And this is to show you how to deal with, oh man, how to deal with references. Now, some of you might just freak out at the moment because you are told in React references are bad. They are like the root of all evil. You don't use references. Well, in React, that may be the case. In Vue.js, not so much. It's just a way to grab an instance of either a component or a tag and do stuff with it. A good example is if we want to show a dialog, then that dialog will just be referenced using the dollar refs, the name of it, that's exactly the same name as I've given here. Let's call it dialog one so that it is at least a little bit different than the tag name. And if I call it, here I am, here I am, a dialog. Okay, please bear in mind, dialogs are not directly available in Firefox yet. They're hidden under a feature flag. They are, however, available in Chrome. That's why I am using them. And now the magic of <clears throat> at and Vion. So events. Um, whenever a component would like to notify um, the enclosing component or the component that contains the other component that something has happened, like in this case, um, we uh, we have clicked the button. Okay, this is a sim simple HTML button. We just want to react to the click event. Then we use the Vion directive. We specify the event name, like here's the vion, and here's the direct uh, the event name, and we tell it a method name or a little bit of JavaScript that we would like to call uh, when that action or when that event triggered. Okay, so whenever I click the uh, button, I am executing the show dialog method. All methods in view are automatically scoped to uh, the component itself. So if I console log this, you will see that uh, in the console we are seeing 
the view component itself. So this is always known. It's not like in, for example, in React where you don't know the this and you have to rebind things uh, yourself or use um, the arrow function instead of uh, just a simple function. No, in view, everything is already bound to the component itself. And the close, by the way, in this case, it's also a, an on click. Please, please note, there is a difference. I just said at instead of v on column. This is a shorthand notation. Somebody previously asked me if I am using the uh, shorthand notation for binding, like so, just a column, or v bind column and then the field name. No, I am never using in production code the full version of it. It's always for me at and the event name and uh, column for binding just values to, pro to properties or to props. Moving on, because we need to use uh, to go really fast, we're going to create a, um, what do we have next here? Register message components. I've seen that, change the implementation that we've covered previously, slots we've covered previously. Okay. Uh, somebody asked me about, um, about slots previously or how to handle uh, passing downwards the content of a um, uh, uh, the body of, of definition. Um, I'm going to show you something called the page template view. It's just a component like anyone else, like any other uh, component, but this time it uses multiple slots. Okay, so those slots are not just slots, or at least this one is just slot. The other ones have names like footer, like sidebar, like header, and they by default will have some content. Sidebar, header, footer. I've also included some CSS. I normally don't do this, but in this case I had to. Um, and we will just change this guy here into page template. So not a simple diff but a page template. We are going to import it from components that, like that. We could also do just components with a, with a dot. Uh, the difference between a dot in this case is it is um, relative to the file we're working with. So relative to app.js and a, an at sign in a project created view, with Vue.js tools always refers to the SRC folder. So <coughs> Sorry, that one. It is a nice way of making sure that the paths are always the same, even if you move bits and pieces uh, over uh, a bit between elements in the application or between folders. Okay, so now what will happen now is I will get a an error because I didn't define it in the components section. And I'm going to use the shorthand notation, and there we go. The same thing that we've had before, only in a template. Now, a good practice is to put headers in the header. So we're going to say template. Uh, we're going to say that this is for slot. I think I've got it wrong. Okay, slot uh, header. template and there we go and this way we have told you that um, although this portion of the temp of the body of the tag is uh, of child, child elements this goes into the default one into the default slot this here is a portion of a different slot I think it's pretty cool it's an extension to what web components provide because web components, as far as I know, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because that would be awesome if web components would do this. <clears throat> but in this case, it's an extension, as far as I know, to the web component specification, allowing you to name a slot. And so we still have the same functionality, but we've got a nice page layout. I will do one more thing, um, and that also has to do with um, with slots. 
but this time we're going to do dynamic, dynamically generated slots. So bear with me. What would definitely benefit from dynamically generated slots? It's a data table. That's right. A data table is something that can definitely benefit from generating slot names with the definition that's been given. Okay, so I think I should have I should have that data in here. So let's first use that component in the template. We, I think we can do it here. So this is, this is our dynamic table. It will um, receive some columns. This is the prop called columns and also some rows. Rows will be the rows of data. Columns will be the definition of columns, obviously. Um, and with that, we're going to need to import it from the uh, from components and register it. So dynamic table. And um, I'm going to remove that for a second to show you how it will work uh, directly. Like in a second, we need to define some data. Uh, like so missing. Now we have um, a, three people defined in the list of people and we have a prescription of how to uh, display the data in a table that's called columns. Um, we are now uh, just passing on those two elements and I see I screwed up something. What did I screw up? Components dynamic table. Because uh, I, I called it data table. Oh my goodness. It's a dynamic one. There we go. And it's a dynamic table. As you can see, we've got some headers which are rendered in here. Uh, and this is also a good time to tell you that iteration in view is done with the v4 directive. Uh, you could also iterate using, I don't know, just numbers, one through 10, for example. But exactly the same thing happens in view or is required in view as with any other uh, modern framework. Each iteratively, iteratively created element needs to have a key to speed things up. If you don't do this, you will get a nice warning that, hey, it's nice to have a V-bound key uh, to make sure that view knows how to render things efficiently or to be honest to how to render things period because if you don't do it weird things are going to happen so remember always bind the key um that was the first iteration that i that, that i've done here so i'm just iterating over headers or over columns and i'm creating headers in the key head now the body is also interesting because it does the iteration over rows so each person will now be rendered as a set of TDs. And here comes the wow part. The name of the slot, we, you remember we've given the names here, right? They can be calculated based on some, based on some data. And with that, check it out. I'm just making a slot that has a def that by default just, oh, come on, by default just renders the text or the value of the uh, of the field, and um, it also passes in some data downwards in case you would like to render the field by yourself. And how we can do this? Again, by specifying the template the uh, template for rendering a cell inside of it here, like so. And again, another shortcut version because the slot would be the default one and i'm just using the shortcut version here with a hash so we've got three shortcut versions remember the column for column as in two dots one above the other um, that's for binding to a field you can see that with the columns here uh, we have the at sign for binding for providing callbacks to events or uh, not only events, but also to, um, how do you call this thing in, uh, in JavaScript? It's something that slipped my mind. Native events. 
Uh, and the third one, uh, the hash for naming um, or for binding to or providing the name of a template when we are using. Also, uh, note that uh, I have two binding elements here. One is the cell, which is the value of the row, and then the row itself, so the entire person, so to speak. I am just binding here the cell, uh, and then I'm using the cell value to render it with an italic. And there you go, it's italic. We can also add some styling. Style equals uh, color red. Uh, font weight default, and there we have Yoda is 700 years old. Who would have thought? Okay, that's it when it comes to uh, the first part about um, best practices. Uh, always remember to um, use the shorthand version because it's cleaner and easier to use for naming slots for um, binding to elements and for um, defining event handlers. And try to keep your components as small as possible, which is what the next section is all about. But before we go there, let's see some questions. Okay, ID, the, uh, the order of this structure is constant, like first template, then script, and then styles. Uh, no, uh, you can have multiple uh, script sections. You can, I think, you can definitely have multiple style sections. So you can have one scoped, one not scoped, and then another scoped, and then another not scoped, and so on and so forth. Uh, but there's only one template sec uh, section, and they don't have to be in this uh, order that you can see on the screen. Uh, can we include style for a particular component using link href? href, no, src, yes. And the same thing goes for script tag, and the same thing goes for the template section, which means that you can have a template that's coming in from another file. You can have a script that's coming in from another file, and you can have styles that are from another file. You can also do stuff like this, which is completely magic, and I don't have it installed right now, but you can do stuff like this, style, um, lang equals scss, and if you have a CSS installed, maybe I can do it pretty quickly. npm install, um, npm install uh, node says, uh, yeah, node says, maybe that will work. Then you can do, I don't know, let's do some, oh, that's it. Let's see if that will work out of the box. That would be pretty awesome. I think we need a little bit more than just that. You need the SAS loader, okay. Uh, no worries. npm install save SAS loader. Which is kind of obvious because we're working with Webpack underneath the hood. Maybe we'll do the background of the body, just like that. Uh, no, 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 come on. And yes, no, do we have SAS support? Yeah, we have SAS support. And in order to show you this, I'm going to say add um, ampersand and hash app and let's say font family and say Trebuchet. There we go. I hope that answers Karolina's question. Pavel Stronsky, Stronsky, can we include style for a particular component using that was answered? Uh, I didn't show you this exactly, but SRC is the uh, attribute that you're looking for. Um, uh, back to Lang for a moment. Uh, this guy here can also be used on a script. Uh, so a Lang equals 
TS if you have the proper TypeScript uh, support installed. But more importantly, you can also use pug, for example, for templates by specifying lang pug, a pug like this. And lang, if I can only type today correctly. And you can use any language in any component freely, whatever you like, which I think is the only framework available on the market today that lets you do this. There's no other one that lets you do this so easily. Okay, uh, if you compare React rendering and view rendering, is there any major differences? Yes, speed. Speed, did I mention speed? And also speed. View is the second fastest from the more commonly known or used uh, frameworks. There's another one uh, which in version three, view will three ver view will be faster than that one. Uh, the second thing is the size. I mean, we all know Angular is like huge. It's not for the faint-hearted. If you want to transfer an application written in Angular uh, over the wire, it's like a megabyte, just the bare minimum. Then React is over a hundred megabytes. Uh, sorry, it's not hundred kilobytes. <laughs> it's like, no, sorry, React, it's you're not that bad but it's 100 kilobytes plus your application. View is about 60 kilobytes with the application included, which I can demonstrate, but I don't think it's necessary to, to show you this. It's a lot smaller, it's a lot faster, and it's just beautiful. Um, moving on, can we, uh, can we use registered component in different way, like in lowercase dynamic table, dynamic table? Yeah, you can. You can, you can use, for example, dynamic table like so, and view will not hunt you down for it. You can do it like this, and it's also going to work. So you can use snake case, uh, or kebab case in this case, and kebab case in this case, it's a wonderful English, I think. Uh, but still the definition needs to be uh, like this. Um, Hubert. I never used Vue before, so please don't laugh. I am not going to. Can we see split template script and styles into separate files? I think I answered that. Uh, Hubert, please tell me if, if the answer I gave previously with the SRC uh, attribute uh, kind of helps you. And please be reminded, this is, an, this is a uh, talk for technical people. We don't laugh at each other. We don't laugh from each other. We just laugh at the government, <laughs> I had to say that. Okay, um, cleaning up the questions now. And I have two more things that I wanted to show you in the last section of our presentation, uh, which is edits, like components that can edit something. Uh, do you, you do remember probably, hopefully, remember the V model that I showed you here. Uh, that was able to edit a message in place. It's all fine, nice, and cool. But the V model is actually a composition of two things. One thing is a binding to value, value message. And the other thing is reaction to input event, which means that message equals dollar event is exactly the same thing as we had before. Now we can use that to our advantage and create components that are like editors. And I am going to show you one, uh, which is going to edit just, uh, just a field, new file, and that's going to be an editor. View. Um, besides the value prop that I showed you that has to be there, by convention, it's one of the very few conventions that we have in view. Um, in order to, um, for this component to be bindable with view model, you also needed to emit an event uh, called um, input. So this guy here and this guy here, they form the support for a component to do uh, V model binding or V model like binding. Let's import that edit editor here. Import editor from uh, components uh, components editor. 
and let's um, register it. We can also put it. Uh, let's do it down here. Down, down below. Editor v editor v model, and our v model will be message as usual. Now, in the case of let me do it in a p in a paragraph. That will look a little bit better. Now, uh, when I edit something here, you notice that there's nothing changing. The reason for it is quite simple. The uh, value of the property is not being changed at all automatically. Uh, whenever the value is um, changed from outside, or whenever it's given, I am storing it internally in a data field and I am editing in that input that internal value, see? Which means that whenever I want, like in this case, uh, hello all, I can click save now and emit that input event with the internal value, which will then propagate to my message. Okay, now I know this might be confusing uh, a little bit, but this is how vModel works. Again, going back to the HTML, it's binding of the value and emitting the um, input um, or capturing the input event and assigning it to the same field because we have to do something with the value. So that's how a, an editor works. And there is one tiny little thing that you should know. Um, the value bound here, um, assigned in here is only assigned once. So if it changes from outside, we can, we can demonstrate that in here by providing another, uh, another P, another paragraph, and an input that binds to, or, or B, it does a B model to the message, uh, like so. And you will see I'm changing that uh, and it's changing with me, but if I remove the watch here, this is a little bit too much for the beginning. If I change this, see the value inside of it does not change because it's, it's changed just once. And for that reason, another concept in view is uh, is being utilized called called the watchers. I know watchers does not don't, don't seem to be like a good idea. Uh, you should rather use some other things like computed property, for example. Uh, but watchers are genius tool to uh, watch for the value. Whenever it changes from the outside, you just know it's changed. So you in, uh, instead inside, inside your um, uh, component, you can update the internal value so that whenever someone edits it from outside, you can change it. And then when you click save, you emit the event and the value is then back propagated into the message data from the application. Okay, that was a whole lot of things. And I think we're running out of time slowly. Um, if there's anybody who really needs to go, uh, I won't hold you. But if you have time, I am also not in a hurry to do anything. Uh, Elston, talk to you. I have two or three more things that I would like to show you very much. Uh, but if you actually two things, uh, a, an editor in a dialogue, actually, I'm going to do that right now. That's something that we, uh, that we can easily show and then explain how it's, uh, how it's done. New file, um, editor dialogue view, two fast ones. So we already know the, uh, the value, the internal edit. It's exactly the same thing. Now it's just going to be in a dialogue. Uh, so, bye, Agnieszka. Uh, so, we're going to import the editor dialog. Dialog, dialog. And then we need to do it just as here. And this will make a lot more sense. Uh, we need also a button. Like so, click me and that button. Now 
going to oh we have already that maybe we can use that one we can remove that guy here just use this one open dialog let's close that one. let's show that one. okay that way and there we go The editor is now gone. A module error is named. The editor component has been registered but not used. Okay, that's ESLint just kicking in. There we go. And one more thing is probably missing show model. Show model, show model, show model, show model. It's not show model, it's just open and close. Open. And what's more? Find the find and because it's not dialog one, it's the ref needs to be there. And now hopefully, yay! Okay, so this will make more, a lot more sense uh, now. Uh, editing in line with a save button, not really. Uh, sensible thing to do, but editing within a uh, dialog box uh, makes a lot more sense because you might want to cancel the edit and you don't want this to propagate uh, upwards. But if you do an OK, see this has propagated here. So this is where the uh, split between um, internal value and manually emitting, emitting the, um, uh, the input event really makes sense. Okay, that was the 20th point that I had today. That was a whole lot of things. Let's switch to questions because I am sure there will be some. No, it was going too fast probably. Uh, but okay, time for, time for questions, I guess. <laughs> Tomek said, please keep going. This is awesome. Thank you, Tomek. That's very kind of you to say. <sighs> you didn't see that. Um, any more questions? Comments? Could you give us this example after? Olga, after? after the presentation. Uh, everything that I've been talking uh, about here, every single um, bit and piece of code that I wrote here will be in the repository on GitHub. 100%. Love you too. Uh, why don't you recommend using Watch? It's not that I don't recommend uh, using it. It's like with GoTo. Okay. I, Severin, I know I told you this before, but everyone else might not be aware of this concept. So let me explain. There's this thing called GoTo and everybody in the whole community will tell you don't use GoTo. Just don't use it. It's an old deprecated blah, blah, blah thing. But it just so happens that it's a very useful tool for implementing sophisticated state machines that need to swap, state, uh, that need to jump from one place to another at different intervals. And this is something that the computers do very well. Even when computers write programs for computers, like, I don't know, maybe language parsing generators, Lex and Yug, those two things rely on the go-to uh, and on lots of labels. Now, the same thing goes with uh, with um, watchers. View is reactive by default. So if you would like to have, let's say, uh, this is this is going to be a very good example. Let me let me show you this. Let's uh, define two fields. One will be first name, uh, John. I'm sorry, John, that I'm bringing you on so much, and last name which is going to be Doe, because John and Doe, they come good together. 
And if we would like to print them out, we will definitely do first name and dash, oh, just without the dash, last name, right? But that is something that is not necessarily one thing. Those are two things. So if we would like it to be one thing, we should defi define something called a computed property. I haven't talked about this yet, but computed is a block like any other uh, block. Uh, and that block is uh, just define some functions. And those functions will then be um, like fields in the data, but computed. Computed from what? Well, return this dot first name plus um, maybe like so, plus so that we see any difference or dash uh, this dot last, last name. Now we can use full name instead of this madness here. And it will show the exact same thing that is the same defined in here. So if I change this into a space, we'll see John Doe. Now, I know this um, component here, or should I be able to know? Let's do a little bit of magic. Uh, app uh, equals a window, app equals view. App, then we have um, child, children, First children, that's the component and message. Yeah, and we've got message, so we also have full name. And this full name is now generated from uh, first name and last name automatically. First name, if we change first name to Jane, which is another, another nice name for a girl, it's like, it also changed. Now you could do this a different way. You could say, uh, whenever the first name changes, I would like to uh, change also the last name uh, or the full name. If I would define it in here, instead of a computed property, if I would define it like so, full name being uh, Jane or John Doe. Oh, come on. And if I define a watcher, watch, whenever someone changes the first name, it has a new value. Then I would like to update the, this full name to be uh, the new uh, value plus the space plus this last name, okay? And this will also work, or at least should if I can type properly. This should do the exact same thing, so if I uh, change the first name to Jane, it will switch. But see, this is only because I told it how to react to changes to first name. And Vue already knows that um, if I do this, that the full name is composed of both the first name and last name, which makes things so much simpler. And you can, even if neither of those changes, the portion of the uh, of the screen of the DOM will not be regenerated. So it's uh, it even has some additional memo memoization, meaning the old value is kept like cached until any of the elements that formed the value change. So if you have an if statement and in one place of the if statement you have two set of fields and the other one two other set of fields, then only the three elements, not the whole expression will, uh, will be remembered as the defining factor for when to regenerate the, uh, the value. So it's like the best thing after the sliced bread from my perspective. Like computer properties that know what is forming them. I hope that answers Severin's question. Uh, Krzysiek T, um, have you ever tried to use Mbox as a state manager? No, I am not doing React uh, since, I don't know, three years, two years. We yeah, have been doing a little bit of React recently, but not with Mbox, no. Um, and I'm like view crazy, like totally view crazy. And like, I'm, I won't even go there, <laughs> like how crazy I am about view. 
can it detect dynamic values like this uh, first name? Of course, of course. Um, get this. We have the uh, we have the table here, right? And the table is people. So it's just a table with three elements. So let's take the second one or the first one, not the zeroth one, but the first one. And let's say the age of uh, Jane Smith in this case is now 27. It's still within the realm of possibility. See, 27. Now I'm going to change it to 30 to be, or to 40 to be more in my kind of range of uh, ages. And it changed automatically as well. So it does matching. I hope that answers your question. What do you think about Flux implementation of Vuex compared to Redux? It's much simpler and better, in my opinion. Adjo, you are so right. Um, I uh, I think that um, and don't don't get me wrong. I think React, regardless of what I said before about React and Redux and whatnot, I think those are like immensely great step stones towards um, learning view. The reason being, those are very simple concepts blown to hell uh, in, in, in so many different implementation possibilities I would never imagine possible, okay? But that all comes from, uh, from things like functional programming that, view, uh, that uh, React is using to an enormous extent and Redux as well. After all, Redux is reducer, which is a functional concept or functional pattern. Uh, when it comes to Vue and Vuex, um, Vuex is more of a Vue, um, um, stop. Uh, Vuex is more like a Vue thing, which is geared towards making things right and making things readable. Like, Set state in React for me, that's the worst thing that could ever happen ever to any library. I think it's, it's like ugly. Assigning a value to a field is nice. And this is exactly what happens in, um, in um, Vuex. You just assign a value to a field and that's it. Uh, even if it's a computed property, it can have a getter and setter uh, and you could assign a value that will then go into the store. Similarly, in um, Redux, in order to do asynchronous operations, you need something called the func. And don't get me started how it's implemented. In Vue, uh, or in Vuex to be precise, you have the concept of actions, which by default are asynchronous uh, or can be asynchronous. And there's nothing standing in your way of doing Ajax calls in Vuex. And not to mention things like getters uh, that are automatically like computer properties, which means they are both reactive and with memoization um, and so on and so forth. Yes, I think, Raju, that Vuex is a much superior, a much, com much, more, much more complex solution compared to uh, Redux, which similarly to React, is a very core library that everybody builds on top. I mean, to, to bottom line this, for me, uh, Vue does everything right and React does nothing. It, not nothing right, but does nothing. Uh, com to, to give you the perfect example is dealing with classes. In Vue, you can basically do binding to class, which can be an object uh, of which field will have a value. And if that value is true, then the class will be uh, embedded or not, or but will be added or not. It can also have a, um, an array, uh, which means in this case that uh, F1 or C1 and C2 will be added to the class. And you can mix and match those. So it can be both an array and a static, uh, an, an array and an object and whatnot. For this, in React, you need a separate module called, called classes, I believe it was, uh, which is stupid because that's one of the core competences of a web framework. Okay, I'm going to shut up about React now because I can go on and on. And like I said in the beginning, I get carried away. 
Um, Camille, for now you're talking about view in superlatives, but there is something that you are, what you do not recommend, what we should pay special attention to, maybe there are some exist some problematic or tricky methods or something else. Hmm. There is one thing that may be tricky uh, in the you know in the long run, um, and that is that uh, when you're passing state on and on and on, that state needs to be reactive in order to for the changes to that state to be uh, reflected in the elements that you're uh, that you're editing or that you're showing on the page. So sometimes when you Excuse me. Sometimes when you, for example, do, um, oh, this is a good example. Uh, I'm going to make um, a field here called F1 that's going to be undefined. Okay. And uh, I'm going to print that value undefined here, that F1, not G1, F1. And I'm going to make that an H1 so that we can actually see it. Okay and duplicated key full name because I have the full name as a computed property, okay? Um, refresh, no errors, good. So we have a field called F1 that we do display, but if we change it to test, oh, it actually happened. I don't know why, but it shouldn't. So it, essentially, uh, maybe that will, work if we're in a um, in an array. So let's do F1, F2, and that will be a proper, like so. Maybe that'll be a change. F1 dot F2. No, that works too. But previously there was a problem like that. If the field was undefined, then it will not be reactive. And you might stumble upon this in arrays, for example. Uh, I think it, it's, it, it, the problem appears when you're, uh, when you're having reactive arrays. And if one of the elements inside the array was undefined, then uh, that element will not be automatically uh, reactive. And you have to pay, pay special attention. If you don't want it to display, just instead of undefined, put it, put it a null, put a null inside of it. And, that will work exactly the same. It will not be displayed on the screen. But this is probably the only thing that I found um, tricky when it comes to uh, view. There is one other thing, and this is where React truly shines and view sucks big time. I mean like sucks balls big time. And this is the definition of, uh, of um, props, prop types. So it would be great to be able to specify that this columns here is an array of objects that contain a title and a field. The field should be a string, the title should be a string, but no, that's not possible. You can either have a constructor uh, function here or a name of a type like array, string, number. This validation will be performed, but nested, it's really tricky. There is a um, there is a thing called validator. I guess it's validator. Uh, that is a function that takes uh, the um, argument and returns true or false, uh, and to tell it or returns maybe even a message uh, to tell that sorry, but the passed in argument is invalid. Great for validating single values if you want like to make sure that the um, passed in value is in a set of acceptable values, but it's a pain in the butt to, to work with that. So specifying prop types, React wins hands down. If you put uh, TypeScript on top of it, it's absolutely unbeatable to like, don't even get me started. That's, that's the only thing that React does absolutely great and Vue doesn't. I hope that answered your question, Camille. We have some more questions in the chat, I guess. Dun, dun, dun. Um, Severin, internationalization. 
the difficult work. Yes, there is a package called View I18M that will allow you to do uh, internationalization. There is also a package for validation called View Validate or View Validate or V Validate. There's a number of those. They're third party, not delivered as part of the View package. Um, what uh, no, that was in um, in the response to Alyssa Alicia um, question to multi language. Okay, uh, that's it. What I had for you today. I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, if I did not like do or did not say about something that you wanted to to hear desperately wanted to hear about. Uh, that's not a problem. Uh, my email is patcom at gmail.com. Uh, you can also find me on Slack. Here's, oh, sorry, not on Slack, on Skype. Uh, this is my, this is my Skype ID. And to that end, may the force be with you, always. You can find me everywhere, as you can see, always. Um, and have a good time. <laughs>